1918. That's another one of those, wow, we have a different course of history too. But because it's 1922 when he had a stroke and would die, then who took power in the Soviet Union? Joseph Stalin. Yeah. And Stalin, he talked about international revolution, but Stalin basically just accepted, he called it socialism within a state, just the Soviet Union. And so the Soviet Union, really in reality, they just became a new Russian empire, a new Russian empire. And that would be the beginning of a horrific totalitarian state. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And this is where we get the USSR. The Soviet Union or the Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics. You notice it says Union, like it's implying that these different groups of the old Russian Empire came together voluntarily. No. They were conquered by the Bolsheviks. They talked about free or um, no, self-determination and the free will of the people. No. They just took it. But this fear of communism, especially after Warsaw, it's like they can come back, led to a whole number of right-wing pro-business groups all over Europe that were intensely anti-communist, anti-Bolshevik, intensely, all over. It's one of the things that people don't really talk about as you know, it's easy to look back after World War II, especially in places like Britain, and they'll say, well, you know, we knew the Germans were bad, but we weren't ready for them. They were too strong right away. No, there were big groups all over, but in France and Britain, that liked the new right-wing governments that took over. They liked Mussolini. They liked Hitler. Or at least didn't think it was that bad. More like better than the commies, right? Better than the communists. So these right-wing groups... While this is going on, it's no coincidence the U.S. has their Red Scare at the same time. It's not a coincidence. It's also very anti-Semitic, but that's another story. So naturally, we got to talk about Italy. Isn't it time we go to Italy? Not for good food. I'm making that up completely. Best food in the world. Mm -hmm. say we're going to talk about it later a lot, and we don't end up talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> or like you're going to tell a story later, <laughs> we'll get to that later, and then we never get to it. Maybe we do get to it when you forget when we got to say the original. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe start writing it down. Yeah, start writing it down. Start writing, it down. start writing things down. Send it to your congressman. <laughs> we'll go through the process. We'll get it started. And when it gets out of the court system, then I'll tell you the story. Stories, I feel like I well, I just do that to you on purpose. I went to your job and I thought I would. Right? Sometimes I forget. But I will talk about the Soviet Union later. I have to. Uncle Joe. Italy. <laughs> Italy was humiliated after the war. Yeah, they won, but remember, they really weren't a part of the Treaty of Versailles. They didn't get the land they thought. They got this and this, but that's it. They thought they were going to get all this and parts of Turkey and parts of North Africa. And they went through shaky government after shaky government in the 1920s. There was no real strong government. No party had the majority. They didn't have a government like ours, they had a parliamentary system. And so it kept collapsing. By 1921, the biggest party in Italy was the Communist Party. They had about 30% of the, their parliament. It wasn't a majority, they couldn't form a government, but right-wing, pro-business people were really scared that the communists might win. And they began to fund a couple different right-wing parties, but they finally coalesced around one. Started by a former socialist newspaper editor and reporter. He was a veteran of the war, and he would change to ultra anti communist His name? Benito Mussolini. <laughs> what did he say? That was Hitler. It's a joke. Not a joke. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was totally good. All right, so back. Mussolini. All right, so Mussolini. His party was called the Fascist Party. And he called them the Fascist Party because, why is your phone out? What are you doing? I was texting. Oh, yeah. Oh, at least I got a phone. It saves time for me when I got to call other people and take pictures. <laughs> Okay, so the fascist party, and the idea was is to go back to ancient Rome, to go back and get the glory of Rome. Italy really was not a unified country. Italy really had different groups. It's really different between northern Italy, central Italy, southern Italy, Italy. Did that bad? And Italy. <laughs> Sicily is their own little like, uh, entity along with Sardinia. It never felt like an, a full country. There's still a lot of difference between them. It never really industrialized. And so that was Mussolini's key. I will unify us together like a new Rome. And a fash is a symbol of Rome. Just imagine about this wide, yard long sticks. They're called fash. And they would bind it together. And that would be the symbol of Roman justice. A Roman council, he would have someone carry this wherever the, the council went. And the idea was in the Roman Republic, the council could administer the law, meaning he had this state to beat people. Punish them. If the Republic was threatened, they would have a dictator. And the dictator had the power to execute. So they put an axe on it. That became the, the symbol of the Roman Empire, and thus the symbol of Mussolini. Fascism then became, that's how it got its start. Clever, isn't it? Unified together like old Rome. But it became an entire form of government. And one more thing to add about it. The reason why it became popular, the reason why the fascist party would take power, is because it was intensely anti-communist. Veterans of World War I who were without jobs, unemployed, uh, they would be essentially Mussolini's private army. He had full control, but they would all dress in black shirts, and he got all this money from the wealthy individuals of Italy. The business owners, the capitalists in Italy funded Mussolini, gave them money, gave them money to travel and get more black shirts and got these discouraged veterans to join. And they would march in the streets and break up communist rallies and beat the heck out of them. They were thugs. So they would carry around clubs, they would carry around fash, and beat them up. And became literally street violence as you get um, black shirts, all in black, communists in black with red armbands, just brawling. Italy was falling apart by 1922. And by 22, Mussolini, who really didn't have a goal. It appears like his only goal was to have a nice, cushy cabinet post in the government where he could get a lot of money, become powerful, and have as many mistresses as a human could have. That was, I'm not kidding, his goal. But things just kind of happened. More things just happened. And he made this big deal how the black shirts will march on Rome and restore peace. Well, this became such a big deal that it looked like there might be a civil war. And the king offered the government to Mussolini. That's how it happened. In the constitutional monarchy of Italy, the king could ask, could ask someone to form a government. It was technically not completely outside the bounds of their constitution. This happened in 1922. By 1924, it happened in 1922. By 1924, Mussolini, Mussolini is now the leader, the full-fledged dictator of Italy. And Mussolini, smart man, can speak five languages, clever, great speaker, very charming. He was not like, he, he didn't, he, he was, did not know, or was really well educated, he wasn't intellectual, but he was smart, he was clever. And he took other right-wing ideas 
and molded them into fascism and would become the philosophical fact, uh, foundation of fascism. Adolf Hitler considered Mussolini a teacher. And even after fascist Italy fell in 1943, Hitler protected Mussolini, even rescued him to make sure that Mussolini would still, or like he, or, more, or let me phrase that, it was more like he felt the old Mussolini something. So these are the, uh, the basic ideas, the foundations of fascism. The foundations of fascism. Number one, intense nationalism. Intense. Remember, this is not, we like Italy because of what it stands for. No. We are Italian because we are great. We, in fact, they would call the Mediterranean Sea their sea, Mare Nostra, our sea. Nationalism, glorification of the state. The state. Now, this is important. Not the individual, not the individual, the state over everything. As an individual, you are weak. Together, we're strong. The state, nationalism state, meaning one people, not a bunch of individuals, one people. Next, number two. That means one leader. One party in charge. All of the parties were gotten rid of, and the leader would speak for the state. I have no idea why I made a capital N. It's kind of a capital N, isn't it? What do they call him? Anyone know? The leader. His poster would be everywhere. They made it almost like a godlike figure. They called it a cult of personality, where they would put his picture out there. And everybody, if you got a job in government or were in the military, you pledge an oath to Mussolini. Mussolini was everywhere. He had to be in everybody's house. You better have a picture of Mussolini. Who doesn't have a picture of Mussolini? Number three. That's actually the truth. <laughs> That's when they would come for you. L. That's an L. Duce. El Duce. The leader. Francisco Franco would become the fascist dictator of Spain. He was El Supremo. What was Hitler? Hmm? You ever heard of Der Fuhrer? The leader. That's all it was. Leader. He speaks for all. He knows. And those who join the party follow him. Not individuals, together under someone who knows. Next. Therefore, that's a three. That's a really good three, isn't it? Don't give me that one. Anti-democratic. Anti-liberal. Anti-democratic, anti-liberal. Democracies are weak. If individuals are voting, they can be easily swayed by stronger people. Now get what I say. There are stronger people in this philosophy. You can be swayed. Or in democracies, there'll be a party. There are a bunch. There are 50 parties in Italy. Italy's now divided, aren't they? Three little parties, that makes it easy to conquer. And for that matter, anti-liberal. People should not have individual rights or equality. Well, first off, we're not all equal. Secondly, if everybody's thinking about their rights and equality, they're not thinking about the state. If you're thinking about yourself, the state gets weak. You are nothing. The state is everything. You have no identity except for you're an Italian in the state. My name is Hosh. We'll take over to school. Thank you. Four. If you believe that only some people are on top, others are inferior, 
individuals don't have rights because they're weak and they don't know what to do with them. What kind of philosophy is this? This is intensely. Fascism is social Darwinism taken to its most extreme. Social Darwinism to the most extreme. We are better than everybody else. Actually, the way we would look at it, if I'm Mussolini, I'm better than you, and you are better than them. Who's them? Everyone else, especially the rotten commies. Five, militarism. The glorification of war. This is very important for these type of states. Military, war. The ultimate way to show your loyalty as a member of the state, to show you're a citizen, is to die for your country. To obey orders and die. Not free will, follow the leader. And this fit in with the warrior uh, that were the flashers, who felt they were underappreciated, and now here's Mussolini saying, you are what makes this country great, if you follow me. So glorification of war. And if you're going to conquer areas and make a new Rome, you need a modern military, don't you? But in militarism, glorification of, of the warrior, it's like you're always at war. We'll get back to that. And six. What, did I say that was it? <laughs> did you write this down? No. <laughs> I didn't realize I said I think it's so many times I didn't realize it's, it's one of those catches. It's like by the way. I say that all the time. Yeah. And I gotta quit saying it. Yeah. Hmm? Oh yeah, how many times did I do it? <laughs> I did not. You are so lying to me. He just pulled out the first number you could think of. <laughs> 27. It was probably like three. So by the way, let's get back to this. <laughs> Very. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that later. <laughs> so, there are... They're essentially pro-capitalists, pro-business. Those are the ones who gave him the money. Mussolini would be the most pro-business type of government. Business leaders, he would say, are the ones that are going to make Italy great. And so we must all work for them. If they profit, the country gets stronger. He, in fact, called his state a corporate state. And the analogy was this. Individuals are like fingers, easy to break. All right? <laughs> but all together, like a fist, huh? That actually was our analogy. Fingers easy to break, a fist is strong, and you can attack. Corporate state, like a corporation. One of the first things that Mussolini did after banning all political parties, got rid of all unions. No unions, because that makes you weak. Why do you think in 1933 those guys wanted Mussolini when they tried to overthrow Roosevelt? Because he banned the unions. They still kind of liked her for a long time. So this is the basic foundation, the fundamentals of fascism. Every fascist state is going to have something like this. Every one. Or at least states that will eventually go there. So, one more thing we have to add. How do you enforce this? How do you make a state where everybody is together as one, following the leader? Okay, propaganda is a very important weapon. And so propaganda, and it's going to be very controlled, we will make sure that people think of certain things. There's going to be Mussolini space all over us. All over. There's a couple really creepy buildings with his, literally, they carved his face all over the building. One is still around. And, or, you know, him farming, or, or whatever it might be, or idealized citizens doing things. Not individuals, not people. They'd just be a generic person. So in Italy would be this idealized kind of Roman figure. Germany's going to have that, they, they're classy, you know, that Aryan thing. 
uh, the Soviet Union brought the worker, I mean, this muscular man or woman, you know, with grain or something. This means grain, if you're not sure. Propaganda. But then there's something else. What about people who disagree? Silence. How do you silence them? What's the best way to silence people? Well, we can use demonstrations out to get them. What's that? Fear. And the demo, this will fit in there. You gotta find an enemy. You gotta get the state, the country, into the state of total war. A state of total war, where you convince your people that they're enemy all around. And if they're enemy all around, if anybody dissents against the state, the country will be weak and they will be conquered. And think how this works for fascism. Who's the enemy? Communists. Communists, and there's communists within the state. So we can get rid of them, and there's now a big country that's communist, the Soviet Union. And they became the enemy. And so then you can get fear going. You can go on to parades to root out and find people who are truly Italian and truly not. People who are communists. You go to a state of total war, so you can ban dissent. Once you ban dissent, how do you do it? What laws did the United States pass in World War I once they entered the war to ban dissent? Yeah, those espionage acts. You ban free speech, censor the press, do all those kind of things. Then what do you need? What does a communist look like? <laughs> Actually, when they would do propaganda uh, movies in the 1950s in the U.S., they had like, Caricatures of Russian would be the communists. But what does a communist in Italy look like? Or, really? Anybody look like you? Or anybody you don't like? Anybody you have a grudge against? Anybody you're jealous of? Any teacher you don't like? You know, you're all thinking about it. Like a communist. <laughs> Turn me in, right? You're all, see? So we're going, will I get something for that? You need a secret police. You get informants everywhere, looking out for people committing dissent. And let's say somebody's out. Now, who would be the most likely rat in this class who would tell? Oh my God. Yeah, wait, wait a minute. What's the first thing that Corey did? He blamed Dale. So, you tell on Dale. Right? Right. So what happens to Dale? Dale dies. Not quite. <laughs> <Dale. laughs> That's not enough. No, no it really isn't. Exactly. So what happens is, no, actually not in front of everybody. Not in front of everybody. Because imaginations are scary. And so what happens is, okay, Dale's in form of. Do we know Dale's a spy? A communist? Who cares? I don't care. I know that when we take Dale away, and when do you come? Four in the morning. That's the knock you don't want. The story was when the purges in the Soviet Union, there'd be the knock followed by a gunshot. Those guys knew what was going to happen once they did. Huh? So, we take Dale away. Who else we take away? His whole family. His whole family. Yeah. Gone. <laughs> Good. They're <laughs> disappeared. Are they coming back? But what do we think is going to happen? Terrible things. Not just a bolt in the back of the head. They're going to be tortured. Horrifically tortured. And what's Dale going to be doing once we start ripping off his fingernails? What are you going to be saying? <laughs> you know what you're going to say? Huh? You're going to be naming other people. Right? As fast as you can name them. Anybody you can think of, you'll be naming names. And what do we do to them? Corey. Yeah, so Corey's probably gone too. Oh, yeah. All the informants. All the informants here. In Russia, they call it the 9 millimeter head. Right? Russians have a dark sense of humor. But you're gone. The point is, 
He's gone and tortured. He's named another name. We don't know what's going to happen to him, but here's the deal. Now the rest of us, what are we thinking? No, actually, we're going to immediately denounce Dale, aren't we? I always knew Dale was bad. Then, of course, somebody like Corey would say, why did you say so? <laughs> but what are we all going to do? No, this is how totalitarian states work. We all act like we never knew Dale. Are we going to say anything about Mussolini now? What are we going to say about Mussolini? He is the greatest leader ever. Who agrees with me? Okay, you two are the rest of you are fascinating. When Mussolini gave a speech, or Hitler, or Stalin, you didn't want to be the first one to quit applauding. See what I mean? <laughs> yeah. In one speech, Stalin gave, they applauded for two hours. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> and, and they're not just going, I mean, it's the. All right, so take your points. But here's the thing you need terror. And the point is okay, let's go back to Corey. Corey told on Dale, what does happen to Corey when he comes back? Not only you live, you get a medal, you be praised, you might get money. And so, what all the rest of us, what do we think? Let's <laughs> Everybody tell on Dale the time of year. No, we're all thinking the same thing. Let's do it. And so you're all looking for it. In fact, the best informers don't need to have to be members of the secret police. So the thing is, who's the informer? It could be everyone. Kids will get rewarded for informing on their parents. Think about it. You get in trouble at home, and so the kid comes like, oh, dad, he's a commie. <laughs> Think about it for a second. This is a scary world. So what happens? Nobody talks unless they know it won't get them in trouble. Meaning no one talks. Because you know there's a chance of terror. Oh, another thing that makes it a really scary is this. Let's say you say something and nothing happens. And then someone says something else that's not even as bad they're taken away and disappeared. That's the term they need to disappear. Does that make it even more scary? You have no idea what will get you in trouble. He gave a name for this state. It comes from total war. Totalitarian. Now, remember, well, I'll show you this tomorrow. We'll get back to it. <laughs> that is the state Mussolini wanted to create. That is the state Mussolini talked about. That is what Mussolini said made a fascist. He didn't have the heart for this. He talked about it. Yes, they banned free speech. Yes, they banned parties. Some political enemies were arrested. But for the most part, Mussolini was talking. He didn't really do it. Who did it? Hitler did it. And even though there were mortal enemies, technically, so did Stalin. They helped each other out. Stalin could not have made it without Hitler and vice versa. <clears throat> so, let's get to Germany then. Hmm? Is that it? Germany. After the war, Germany was in chaos. And they only had a 100,000 man army. And so these informal militias of former veterans of the war were created. And they weren't technically part of the German army. They still wore their World War I uniforms. After they got back from the front, they still had their uniform and helmets, a lot of them. And they were tied to the army, but they couldn't be because of the Treaty of Versailles. They gave them a name, and it's called Free Corps. It's German, literally means free corps as in soldiers, units. And these were militia, we call them today paramilitary, and they would battle communists and used to control the population. They even had machine guns. They even had their own insignia. They couldn't use the German cross. The Germans used a Maltese cross because that might represent the German army. But they all want to have some kind of cross. So they wore some really thin cross, 
uh, an X, they call it a diagonal or, or this, a diamond, square, clovers are really popular, but crosses that kind of be German. What am I getting to? Yeah, swastikas were used. Swastika was a religious symbol, mostly Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, no special meaning the free corps have. And so that's just one of the symbols that these veterans have. When a new right-wing party would be created called the German Workers' Party, they wanted to recruit soldiers, that's why they took the swastika. There's no special meaning to the swastika until Nazi Germany took it. All right, so back to this one. There's Germany. After 1919, they were able to, well, the communists, the revolutions were beaten down, but the communists remained the largest political party in the 1920s in Germany. They didn't have a majority, but they were the largest party. They created a new republic called the Weimar Republic. Weimar is a little town <clears throat> west of Berlin. It's a beautiful town. It's one of the few towns that wasn't destroyed in World War II. And so if you go there, and you feel like you're going to like a medieval German village. It's just a beautiful place. There, if you go to Germany, you go to other German towns, and think, oh, this is a medieval German village. A lot of that had been, was probably built in the 1960s. Because so much of it was destroyed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The wall is there, which is, it's pretty cool. But there are parts they had to rebuild, because it was bombed a couple times. Run looks pretty cool. It's a big walled city. You can take a tour of the wall. And yeah. It's really cool. Yeah, they have um, individual Germans on the wall that helped pay for the rebuilding of the wall after World War II. Because it was, we ran out of things to bomb. So they start bombing little towns too. Literally. Just bombing everything. So, the free call. And they were still around, but think about this as veterans of the war. Now, the Weimar Republic was always a shaky government. It did create a Germany. Germany, a German country, came out of this Weimar Republic. Before, it was still an empire, and there were still little kingdoms within the empire, like a Bavarian kingdom, a Saxon kingdom. Now it's German. And they had a parliament called the Reichstag. And it wasn't a winner-take-all, it was proportional. And so every party, if they got 10% of the vote, if they got 10% of the vote, they got seats in the right stock. And so there are over 100 German parties. And so what always happened to the German government throughout the 1920s was a coalition. It was always a coalition of a bunch of different parties, usually parties in the center, who were not the ultra-right-wing parties or the communist party. It was a pretty shaky government. And they had those reparations. Those reparations were hanging over their head. So after the war, they tried to stabilize their economy and they tried to stabilize the German currency called the Reichsmark. The mark. And they need they felt they needed to stabilize it because even though they had a mark, the reparations had to be paid in gold. So either gold marks or some other currency, like a pound, that's in gold. They had to pay it back in gold. And so they had to kind of go on the gold standard. So you had a weird system in Germany where you had all the gold going out of the country to pay for reparations, and then inside the country they had paper currency called marks. So what happened to the value of gold? Skyrocketed, currency went down. 2021, 20, 22, they were able to stabilize it, but the reparations got to be too much because the economy never improved. Because this is why. It's a very important thing. How do you get gold? How does a country get gold? They need gold. How do you get it? Do you remember mercantilism? What did countries try to do to get gold into the country? Well, colonies would help provide that because it provided raw materials. Imports, you have to pay, and money leaves your country. So what do you want? So what they try to do is get as many exports as possible. Exports. So you bring gold in. 
So they had to rebuild their economy as quickly as possible. Their most industrialized region was right here, called the Rhineland and the Ruhr area. The French and Americans and the British actually occupied this in 1919, 1920. They withdrew. And their idea was to get as many, as many exports as possible. <laughs> then you get the exports in, the government has to get it, right? So the government does what? They tax it. They tax it. So exports tax. And then what do you do to make your exports more attractive? This mark, they created inflation. They drop the value of their currency to make exports more appealing. I mean, think about it this way. Your dollar, an American dollar, not to buy a lot more in Germany. And so what they're hoping is they drop the value of their currency, they'll bring in American dollars. They'll bring in mark, or I'm sorry, pounds. They'll bring in francs. Anybody know a country doing that right now? Japan just did that. China artificially keeps their currency low to do that. Uh, Mexico tried to do that. The U.S. got the money's going up to our our value of the dollar is going up. So it's, we're getting by it artificially. Artificial. Yeah, artificial. What what China does is they buy as many dollars as they can. So by buying dollars, it raises the value of the dollar. Dollar lowers the value of the won. So they have a process. It's, it's 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 a way to keep the value of their of their currency really low. So their exports are really cheap for us. So they can just pour them into the US. So back to this bit. Here's the problem. By 22, it wasn't working. It wasn't working. It couldn't pay the reparations. Going into 23, it was causing a real crisis. And we're leading to something, write down, hyperinflation. This is not, with a, the value of the dollar just didn't go up. Or, I'm sorry, the value of the dollar just didn't go down. It fell off a cliff. Now, the currency was already really low. I was walking to the door, and every step I took was a trumpet down the hall going, bah, bah, with each step. It's Gandhi. Who likes Gandhi? Only John? You're the only one who likes Gandhi? Gandhi was an interesting, like a weird guy. I'll get back to stories about Gandhi. Oh! I didn't turn this on. Corey, could you turn on the projector? <laughs> so, did you get it? Well done. All the bad things I said about you and Dale, gone. So the Germans could not pay the reparations. Exports were not going up. Here's the deal. What happened by 1923, this is what you got to write down, Corey. What you have to write down is they had no taxes. The government was bringing in no gold. If the government has no money, how does it pay the reparations? They got to print more. They just got to print currency. If you have no way to get money into the government, but you owe money in a different denomination, gold, that can cause hyperinflation. And so, the Ruhr Valley in the Rhine. This area right here in 1923, France occupied it again. Because Germany was saying, we can't pay it, we can't pay it. But when they occupied the Ruhr, that's a French soldier in Cologne in 1923. When the French occupied it, what that meant was, Germany could export nothing. In fact, the German workers went on strike. We'll show you, France. And there they are, marching through the streets, this is actually, in, I think it's in Dusseldorf, and they are striking against French occupation. Now there's no exports. There's no tax revenues. The German government has no money, and now they literally have to print money as fast as they can. The value of German marks fell off the face of the earth. 
1919, you see that 170,000 mark or 170 marks to buy an ounce of gold. Anybody want to guess when the hyperinflation began? Look at January, then look at September of 1922. Then look at January to September of 1923. By the end of November, 87 trillion, 87 trillion marks to buy an ounce of gold. Look at this graph. That's how many marks it took to buy an ounce of gold. Let me skip ahead to this one. It was over 10 trillion marks by 1923 to get $1. Marks became worthless. Here are kids stacking up million mark notes because they're essentially worthless by October. A million mark note will buy you nothing. Pretty soon they're printing 50 million. Here's a 2 million mark stamp. A loaf of bread in November, 200 billion marks. People had to be paid in wheelbarrows with wheelbarrows. By the time you got the money, the money was worthless. Look at a wallpapering its house with this. People would use it for fires. Let me show you one more thing uh, for a kite. Oh, let's say you have a savings account. You let's say you scrimp and save. All of a sudden there's hyperinflation. What happens to the value of your savings? Gone. This really destabilized it. I love this. I'll see you tomorrow. You want to kite at Reich's marks? No. Talk a little bit about hyperinflation. Uh, Don't worry. <coughs> what are we doing today? We're going to talk about hyperinflation. Huh? Bread. Yeah, okay. it's the price of bread because of hyperinflation. And so we have. You know, there was already terrible inflation during the war. It's 63 marks for a loaf of bread, and 23 went up to 201 billion, 200 billion marks for a loaf of bread. Wow. I, I want to show you something in this part. It can't happen here unless they totally decide to quit collecting taxes. That is um, in Freiburg. Oh, yeah. At the Munster. Oh, and it's one, one of the gargoyles. Yeah, one of the gargoyles. It's the artist who did it, the priest didn't pay him, and so he made that basically. I read it. Yeah. And it's. That's pretty funny. We that's there, awesome. I was like, what is that? My father was so like, you got to. Oh, and he climbed to the top of it. Um, oh, you did? That's like, cool. It's super old. It's like, we climbed all the way up in the middle. That's but awesome. That's fun. And it's fun. like tiny, like it was this wide, like round stone staircase, just like endlessly up forever. Uh, your claustrophobic are tough, aren't they? No. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a golden castle. Oh, cool. And they had the jewels, the crown of Russia there. Mm -hmm. like Very the cool. Case, you can see. It was so cool. And they had a bunch of outfits and historical things. It was so cool. I thought I'd show you that. This time I showed you. That is really cool. Now that's a funny gargoyle. You know, about that too. I've not been to that one, but I've heard it's really cool. Freiburg's amazing. You know, there's so many cool towns. That's a thing. Whenever I hear about this, I'm always like, I gotta go there. Then I gotta go there. Then I gotta go there. Have you been to Rundberg Lovertal? Yeah. That's cool. No, no, no. 
gross. Let's take a look at me. No, but the, the artist who made the gargoyles on this monster, um, the priest didn't pay him, so he made this face in the priest's house. Oh. You know, unlike you two, I'm not afraid of a fake ma fake rat. Fake rat. <laughs> I don't know everything. But what is one thing you don't know? Exactly. What's the speed of life? You know the thing about what people know about? It's not that I have memory, it's not the if you don't have the how much Read the manual. Prove me wrong. Mile City is the best place for spring break. Said no one ever. Have you ever been there? It's hard to break it. I'm so mad. Well, you can shoot a bullet through it. Somebody did. Okay. So, first off, before we get to. What was it? I have no idea. Oh, two things. First off, what constellation do we know Orion caused the Kennedy assassination? Next. Huh? And who else? Osama bin Laden and Bert. Bert? I don't know what Ernie was doing, but my guess is Ernie. He made a restaurant. Oh, gosh, Chipotle. Put your hands on. I was taking a walk last night. That's all I got. You always walk. I, I do. Walk around all the time. I walk everywhere. But I saw Orion. Orion's almost gone for the winter. It's only in the winter you can see it here. It's really cool. And I thought of where do you live? Where do I live? I'm a citizen. <laughs> I I don't want people to know where I live. I don't want, I don't want people to know me. All right. So where I want those? Where? <laughs> For real! Don't move your ball. He's going to look It won't stop like all But it will help you get trapped. Yeah. This is a Vietnam War. This is Vietnam War. But this is what Americans want World War II. One, we like dancing. This will not hurt me. The front teeth, too? Helmets, cookie weapons. Sam? I did. Cars were good. Cars were seen as good for each. Which roads are these? All right, so, all right, a couple more things about Oswald because it's such an interesting thing. Oswald, all these things happen. Where did he defect to? Russia. Russia. And what did he do when he tried to defect and they wouldn't take him? He yeah, tried to, he slit his wrists, acted like he was going to commit suicide. Let's put the paper away there, Chipotle Beck. 
and